Okay, we might make a start now. It's my great privilege to do the acknowledgement today, acknowledgement of country. And we are um, greeting our visitor today on the Ngunnawal and Ambri lands. And as you survey the scenery behind our speaker, have a think about the 30,000 years that they've looked after the land and how, as a shared contribution to that land, we might all do that together. Um, at that point, I'd like to introduce our um, President and Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University, Brian Schmidt. Thank you, Tim, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to see that we're taking the undergraduate approach, which is to spread out across the entirety of the auditorium. Uh, anyway, so uh, Tim, thank you for your acknowledgement uh, to country, and I, too, pay my respects to elders past and present of the Ngunnawal Nambri people. So it is a great pleasure today to welcome Deputy Director General Najat Mokhtar this afternoon to the Australian National University and to host uh, the IAEA once again. Of course, this year is not like other years. Uh, there is a new focus on, uh, I guess, uh, atomic energy and its regulation uh, in this country due to decisions of the Australian federal government. Uh, Dr. Mokhtar was trained in food and health sciences, uh, holds degrees from Laval University in Canada and the University of Dijon in France. Uh, so I think you're a double doctor. Yes, uh, a real glutton for punishment. Uh, she went on to be a Fulbright Fellow at Johns Hopkins and then held several senior uh, positions within Morocco. For the, fast, uh, for the past decade, uh, Dr. Mokhtar has worked at the IAEA, being section head in the Human Health Division, then uh, Division Director for Asia and the Pacific in the Department of, Department of Technical Cooperation, before being um, appointed to a present role in January 2019. She has enormous experience in the benefits of nuclear science and what it can bring for humanity. And today, uh, Najat will address how nuclear science can help address global challenges, and I think this is going to be one of the important things for us here in Australia to get our heads around, is that uh, we need to have a program here that goes beyond just a very small, specific thing to do with nuclear submarines, but rather one that uh, brings all the good things it can into society. It is a very broad and important topic, and one that I think universities need to make sure uh, we get behind and uh, do the best to, to promote uh, a whole of society uh, set of activities. And I think in this sense, uh, ANU has a special role in Australia in this regard. And I see a very diverse audience from uh, medical science to plant sciences uh, to physicists, of course, mathematicians. So uh, a whole range of people here uh, today. And uh, I guess uh, it will be very exciting, as I said, to get your perspectives. And uh, for me, uh, I have uh, long promised to come and visit Vienna uh, to the agency. And hopefully, when I'm no longer vice chancellor, I will be able to go meet my uh, niece and nephew uh, who live in, in Vienna and come and uh, finally visit. So without further ado, I'll hand over to yourself. Thank you very much. And, uh... <laughs> It's really an honor for me to be here with you all and in Australia, in Canberra, and with the students and with the senior fellow colleagues. Um, it brings me back to 20 years ago. Um, I was also at the university, a professor at the university, uh, teaching biochemistry and food science and nutrition. And uh, really happy to see this beautiful auditorium, very nice. I don't know how much you know about the IEA, um, but I guess, um, yeah. This is, I don't know if you have visited the International Atomic Energy here with our three buildings. Um, we, my, my office is in the, in the left one. We have 175 member states. We have 2,500 staff at the IEA. But we have other UN organizations also that we are on the same site, like UNIDO, uh, UNUSA, the Space Agency, and, 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 and others. Um, uh, going back to the agency, this is what you hear always in the news, isn't it? That uh, nuclear source find in Libya, 
uh, the head of the agency watchdog. This is what they call the agency watchdog. It's going to Iran, it's going to Russia, it's going to Ukraine. But I think many of you maybe they don't know that the agency has also an other um, uh, helmet, which is the use, peaceful use of, nu of, te of nuclear technology uh, for good and for uh, helping member states um, for uh, better well-being, for health and well-being. Um, let me just walk you through a little bit of history of the agency to really show you that it all started with peaceful use of nuclear technology. And, um, sorry, go back to... Uh, this is back in 1953 in New York when the, 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 presid the president, the, the U.S. president, Eisenhower, Eisen, Eisenhower, yes, I always have problem with names, uh, uh, called for a new organization, new agency, to really tackle uh, atoms for peace. And if you allow me, I want just to, 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 to say a few words, the, the word of the president, Eisenhower himself, the more important responsibility of this atomic energy agency would be to devise methods whereby this fissionable material would be allocated to serve the peaceful pursuit of mankind. Experts would be mobilized to apply atomic energy to the need of agriculture, medicine, and other peaceful activities. A special purpose would be to provide abundant electricity in the power-starved area in the world. So it all started with the call to use atomic energy for peaceful use. And then uh, here is the, the first site of the agency in 1957, if you have been to Vienna. This is the... Uh, you see, <laughs> International Atomic Energy, I think is a, which hotel was that? The Grand Hotel, Grand Hotel of the city of Vienna, where the office of the agency was there. And this is the signing between um, uh, the, the, the first agency, uh, uh, Mr. Cole, the first DG of the agency with the Prime Minister uh, of uh, Austria. Uh, again, um, as you have heard, the President Eisenhower calling for the application of atoms for peace. This is the first laboratory, mobile laboratory, back in 1958, donated by um, the U.S. to start doing some research uh, in Vienna. And uh, uh, this is uh, 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 the, the Hofburg, if you can see, this is the Palace Hofburg, one of the beautiful palaces in Vienna at the center. So you see, just I want to bring you back that it's all about peaceful use. It's all about using, harnessing the atoms for peace, harnessing the atoms for medicine, for food and agriculture. Then, uh, of course, to uh, harness the atoms, you need to do research, you need labs, you need to develop technology. And this is the first groundbreaking of the laboratories that we have in Vienna, Cybersdorf Laboratory. It's 50 kilometers from Vienna. And uh, this is the DG uh, uh, call, uh, you know, uh, in the groundbreaking, putting this token about first laboratory, IA laboratory. This has been like 61 years ago. And uh, of course now old labs. So we started since 10 years refurbishing these labs. Oh, sorry, let me go back here. Those are the first research in these labs. As you can see here, this is a scientist trying to uh, study uh, the, the response to uh, radioactivity, iodine radioactive assays, the radioactivity in, in, uh, uh, in thyroid cancer. And here you see this uh, portable scintigraphy. Uh, this is kind of, we have now a laboratory and I will show you, I hope you have a photo of the dosimetry lab in this presentation. And here um, the, the greenhouse, which is still there by the way, where we were looking at varieties of rice here uh, being treated by radiation and looking for new breeding for new varieties of rice. So this is just to bring you back again on the type of research. This is back in 1962 being done in the labs. Um, uh, then uh, again in New York, uh, the member states were worried about the level of radioactivity in oceans and they have asked, tasked the agency 
to do some measurements and to do some, uh, initiate a program to help countries monitoring radioactivity around the world. And here where Monaco, Principality of Monaco offered the infrastructure to host those laboratories, marine laboratories in Monaco. And the first lab was at the uh, Oceanography Museum. If you haven't visited, I strongly recommend beautiful museum in Monaco back to 1966. And here where the, uh, the building, you see up there, the building, uh, those are our laboratories are on the right side, the, the, the three uh, levels of the three laboratories in Monaco, uh, tackling marine environment, and here the Prince uh, Honoré de Monaco, and our director general, formal director general, al in the opening uh, ceremony. Um, I'm not going to, uh, into details what we do, maybe if you have a question on marine environment, and it will come maybe in the discussion here. Um, just, just here to highlight that um, agency, uh, uh, and through the, the, its director general, we got the Nobel Peace Prize. I was honored to be uh, among the staff at that time. And you can see here all the name of all the staff, recognition of the work of the staff to the peaceful use uh, at that time in 2005. And uh, the, the prize, the, the money got um, uh, followed on, on this occasion. Director General, here Director General Barade and the late Amanu DG, they have dedicated this amount, the money, to do uh, some research on cancer and on child malnutrition. And at that time, my background, I was involved in the, in the bringing building capab capacity building in human nutrition. Um, again, uh, on the laboratories, as I have told you, 61 years, and those labs, they host fellows. We do science, we do research. Uh, and it was about time to renew, renovate them. And it took us 10 years, almost, 2023. Those are now our, our new laboratories. This is the sterile, I don't know if we have a, yes. This is the sterile insect laboratory where we use radiation to sterile male insects and release them in the, in the wild so that they can depress the population of insects. And, and then we get rid of insect pests like the fruit fly, for example. And this is environment-friendly technology where we have been applying it it's in many countries, particularly in Latin America. Um, we'll get, and, and, and in the US as well, we'll bringing uh, uh, income generation to many farmers. Um, uh, here, in, in the, on this, oh, sorry, um, going back. Um, uh, here we have our uh, the agriculture uh, laboratory, three laboratories. We have joined a center with FAO, where we really apply the technology throughout the spectrum from soil and water monitoring, plant breeding, animal health, food safety, and insect and pest control. Uh, so we are almost finishing in 2024. We are going to have eight new, brand new laboratories. And again, you are welcome to visit. We host almost 1,500 visitors per year. And, uh, and we host uh, hundreds of fellows from all over the world. And we do science there, CRPs, what we call coordinated research program, where we bring, bring, bring institutions from developed and developing countries to work on common issues like water, soil, and plant, plant production, human health, it's environmental monitoring, marine environment. Um, we, have, like, we are working with more than 1,000 institutions worldwide. And um, let me then give you uh, just a brief on the application that we are doing. Um, as, uh, of course, what we do is always, because we're dealing with radiation, we make sure that safety uh, and security is taken care of. And of course, those are the three main pillars of the work we do at the agency, safeguarding and verification, making sure uh, that the, 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 the declaration of nuclear material at cancer level is well monitored safety and security, making sure that all the work that we are doing using nuclear uh, radiation is uh, following the safety and security guidelines, and of course, the science and technology, which is in the department I'm, 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 I'm heading right now. The work we do, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, tackles several uh, goals from human health to um, food security, 
uh, water security, environmental monitoring, um, uh, and, and marine environment as well. And of course, all the work we do, um, it's linked to uh, the sustainable development goals. We are directly involved in nine SDGs, and we're indirectly um, uh, linked to almost all of the SDGs. Um, let me just give you some examples here um, on, on water. Uh, what we do, um, and I think some of you at ANSTO particularly, we were working with them, is really to use um, stable and radioisotope to date water, uh, underground water, to look at the aging. As you know, more old is the water, more hard to refurbish that water. So giving this information to policymakers, they can uh, have this data to manage better their underground water. So where is the water? How old is it? How good is it? And uh, how long that water can stay there? And of course, this is linked to the cycle of water, surface water, also the precipitation. The agency holds the uh, biggest uh, database on precipitation called Global global network uh, uh, network on, on, on precipitations. So this is very useful and we are modeling this. You can predict and you can tell to the country about the water reserves in the coming five or 10 years. This is very useful and we are building capabilities throughout the world now, looking at um, how we can build capacities, network of labs, water labs, so that they can, water has no, knows no borders. So we need to really communicate among countries. This is about agriculture. As I told you, we have um, a, a joint center with FAO where we use the technology to look at varieties of plants that they are resistant to diseases, varieties of plants that they can uh, uh, grow on, sal on saline uh, uh, soil, for example. And, and this is very useful, particularly now we are talking about climate change. This is a global issue. And so far, we have more than 3,000 varieties of plants. You name it, rice, barley, uh, wheat. Uh, and this is very, uh, the, the very useful also in terms of uh, yield uh, and in terms of resistance to diseases. After that, we, uh, of course, uh, we look also at the harvest uh, and the nuclear technology can preserve food. Uh, this is food safety aspect. We build uh, technology, we build laboratories, we uh, an infrastructure in countries to make sure that the food is safe uh, from contaminants, but also from pests through radiation. If you radiate, for example, an apple, it can stay for more than one year on your desk, and I have experienced that. Uh, and, and what are the same? Uh, so that's, uh, that's an aspect that you don't need to use uh, uh, any other aspects to, to, to get rid of the pest. Um, we, we also uh, use irradiation for, um, uh, I said, I said uh, for, for sterile insects, I have mentioned this before, to also, it's, which is an environment friendly technology to uh, get rid of fruit flight, for example. But now we are using it also for mosquito to get rid of the dengue fever, some aspects of malaria, Etc. Animal health is a big program in our laboratories, and we are building more than 145, I think, 45 um, uh, animal laboratories, veterinary worldwide, to really use the technology, RT-PCR, uh, biosafety cabinets, and radiation to empower vaccines. This is also a new area, uh, and and this is to uh, has was been was has been this laboratory has been very instrumental during COVID-19, provided support to many uh, countries on the detection of COVID. Um, on human health, also it's a big program at the agency. We cover human health from prevention, nutrition program. I have mentioned this morning that um, we are building a database on local food, like uh, Arborigen uh, uh, foods, where we look at nutritional value, but we look, go beyond that. We look at the absorption uh, at, uh, in the body, and if, if the uh, products or the food, we say it's rich in iron, how much of that iron is efficient, and, and to, to really uh, enhance uh, 
uh, the uh, iron content in the body. Moving also to diagnosis with nuclear medicine, uh, you know, you go to the dentist, it's x-ray, you do, you have all done CT scan or PET scan. Uh, so this is also um, uh, an area we don't build the machine, but we train uh, health, care, health staff on the machine. We make sure that the radiation is used in proper way. We make sure that the, that the education models are, uh, uh, education documents are also shared by, uh, with, the, with the universities. Uh, and, and we work together really to use digital learning uh, in this area. Radiotherapy, uh, radiation medicine, radiotherapy is also uh, a big program. This is in our lab. You remember I showed you the first laboratory of dosimetry on, on, on uh, iodine, uh, thyroid cancer. This is the, the latest uh, linear accelerator uh, for radiotherapy. So here we don't treat patient, but here we train, we make sure that the dose is enough. It's not too much, not too little. And we are providing services to more than 3,000 laboratories worldwide. So they send us the dose we make sure we calibrate and we return back and we do a lot of proficiency testing. This is also a WHO collaborating center. We have all, this is a part of the dosimetry work that we are doing. Um, uh, uh, this is on, on, on human health. I hope I covered it. Uh, of course, uh, this industrial application is a, a big topic also. We have a, a department of physics and chemistry. We don't have a big accelerator at our site but we collaborate with other centers, like here uh, with ANSTO, on using the radiation technology uh, for, to help in, in uh, industrial development here. For example, cables. This is in Brazil, where we, uh, where we work with them to develop uh, uh, technology, e-beam technology, to strengthen the cable, uh, car cables, for example, sterilization of medical materials, uh, syringes, uh, masks, etc. Uh, sterilization of food, you saw uh, this is the, the ducks, I think, uh, uh, for also to make, for, for uh, also safety aspects. And of course, the radiopharmaceutical aspects. Um, again, uh, here we have a big program on, uh, I hope, yeah, radiopharmaceutical production. We have a, a, a program that we help countries set in the facility, making sure that they are using, they are producing radiopharmaceutical in safe and secure manner. However, uh, unfortunately, production of radiopharmaceutical or radiation medicine is not widely uh, distributed uh, in the world. There are few countries that they have the luxury to have access to radiation medicine or access to radiopharmaceutical or even access to a radiation technology for industrial application. Still a lot of work to be done uh, ahead. And now, uh, moving to uh, uh, marine environment, uh, uh, you know, or environmental uh, assessment in general, we have a lab on terrestrial environment, and I mentioned we have marine laboratories in, in Monaco. And here, mainly, we help member states to produce good data. And to do that, we need standards. And this is what we do. We produce standards. This is, even we don't have sea, <laughs> this is whatever you want to measure in the sea, you need to use to compare it to the Vienna uh, uh, water standards that we have produced in our laboratories. The CO2 for greenhouses, green gas houses, was produced in our lab, the standard of CO2. We have hundreds of standards that we produce, and we produce also with our collaborating centers to make sure that the measurements are done properly. We run also proficiency testing with many labs. Yearly, we have a, 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 at least 50 proficiency testing worldwide in many areas to monitor the environment, but to monitor also marine environment. Um, uh, as, as I've told you, um, we have been doing this for 60 years, but we are not funding agency. We are technical agency. So we do research in our lab. Once the proof of, of concept is there, it's being transferred to the member states for sustainability. Transfer to the member states, we don't scale. We just teach them how to use the technology. We train, we set small facility, we help them having, again, proof of concept, but then it's up to the country to scale it up because then it needs funding. 
When our director general, Mr. Grossi, came on board, he said, we need to do something because we cannot just transfer this technology and see it sitting there. Because usually we are not talking to finance minister or to the minister of agriculture or to the minister of health. We are talking to technical institutions that they need to take this um, technology and build it there. And then so when you have that hub, it has to be communicated in the country. But of course, we always face the stigma of nuclear. Being a nuclear organization, whatever comes, as soon as you say the word nuclear, this, it, the, the, the people will, will, will run away and they, they don't want to talk to us. Particularly when you go and say, um, I can help you in agriculture. You say, well, FAO is there, they can help us in agriculture or on human health, well, w, what is the role of WHO? So all these questions about what is the role of the IA, why IA is here, why IA is working on human health, or in agriculture or, our, our, or other areas. So we need to find this niche that we are part of the, of the puzzle. We are not coming to compete with WHO or with FAO. We are coming to be part of the solution, to bring the solution on board. Technology, technology driven. And this is the message that we are trying to communicate all the time. Director General said um, during the COVID-19, for example, he said if member states came to IAEA asking for help on, to, uh, to fight COVID-19, it's because they know IAEA first, they know what we can do, what we can deliver, and because they, are, they, need, they need us, they need help. We provided help to more than 300 laboratories. And after that, our director general said, this is not the last pandemic, we will have others, it's better be ready. And this is why he launched the, an, an initiative called Zodiac, Zoonotic Diseases Integrated Action, which aimed mainly at making, making sure that developing, under develop, developing and least developed countries, they have the necessary infrastructure to be able to go and see what is out there to analyze, detect viruses, pathogens that can be of threat to humans. Until this has been launched like two years ago, now we have 128 laboratories worldwide where we are building this capability, doing training together and sharing the best practices in a platform that you can, by, by the way, you can visit. It's I, uh, the Zodiac, uh, uh, Zodiac? Zodiac. Zodiac.ia.org. So you can have all the information uh, available. Um, we do also research here because we want to know what could be out there in each and every region that can be of threat to humans. So we go sample soil, environment, water to be able to detect um, these uh, this pathogens. Uh, as I mentioned, we have marine environment uh, uh, a program, uh, very rich. Uh, every year we have visitors in October, we have the member states, we have the ambassadors coming to visit the marine uh, laboratory in Monaco. Uh, we had the, the honor to have the ambassador from Australia visiting last year. And here we look at, it, I mentioned the uh, radioactivity in oceans with 180 laboratories. But in addition to that, now we are looking also at climate change, ocean acidification the ocean warming and solutions like blue carbon, how we can measure the blue carbon, how we can monitor it. And here is about plastics. All of us, we know that plastic is pro problem worldwide. Microplastic is problem worldwide, but how we measure it? How we assess it? Where are the data? There are none, nowhere. And as we speak, member states are discussing of uh, uh, a treaty that they should be signing to get rid of plastic. How we can monitor that treaty? And this is what our laboratory in, in Monaco with other laboratories, including ANSTO here in Australia, uh, we are developing uh, best methods, guidelines, how to measure microplastics, how to monitor it. And also we are looking at upstream part, uh, how we can use radiation technology to recycle plastic, how we can change the structure of the plastic recycle it to another product that can be reused or uh, amalgam to another product. Oops, sorry, I did something wrong. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, uh, just going back to the plastic uh, part, we are also uh, looking at how we can use, produce biodegradable plastic, and this is something that we are doing with ANSTO, looking at the biomass, irradiating biomass with some chemicals, and producing biodegradable plastic. This is a, a cool part that we are really looking forward. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the, the, the health uh, program at the IEA, and here again, our Director General uh, launched an initiative called Rays of Hope, because um, maybe here in Australia, everyone has access to radiation medicine, to diagnosis. But I'm from Morocco, I'm from Africa. Morocco, maybe we have uh, some linear accelerators, but 70% of African population, they don't have access to radiation medicine. So that means uh, because they are in Africa, their fate is already there. You've got cancer, you don't have access to radiation medicine, you can't, you don't have money to go to another country, you're going to die. This is unethical and unacceptable, and this is what we are fighting for at the IEA, is to really, that uh, wherever you live should not decide on how long you're going to live. And, and the, 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 the idea is to team up with developed countries to team up with banks, with donors, to, to build radiation medicine, to build nuclear medicine diagnosis, early diagnosis, and to build uh, uh, radiotherapy uh, centers to make sure that each and everyone have access to radiation. Uh, I was saying that um, to, one month ago, I was in Morocco and there is this woman that lives 700 kilometers uh, far away from the capital. She was diagnosed with breast cancer one year late, and she has to uh, go for treatment. She has to travel to the capital, and then the, she was given an appointment seven for seven months. Uh, she died because she could not uh, wait. The cancer does not wait, and this is unacceptable. So we have to do something about it. Now we have countries coming to be part of this initiative, and we already started with some countries in Africa. We need everyone everyone uh, because uh, the the work at hand is really so uh, too big to close the gap and but we have to start somewhere um, water is an issue uh, everywhere and i heard also australia it's a big issue and i showed you that we can use the technology really to manage better water resources in australia maybe it's, it's possible because wonderful scientists, wonderful uh, infrastructure. But in countries like Niger or Mauritania, um, the, uh, Morocco as well, um, uh, water is, is a problem. Uh, but to manage water, we need data. And we have been in New York uh, with Nora, like uh, in March, where uh, the, and the water summit, the UN water, and everybody was saying we need data to manage water. We cannot just wait for for precipitation and see, okay, well, uh, my, my well, we will, I will have some water in my well. So we need to build these capabilities, the science, science for policies. And this is what we are doing now, is we are launching a network of laboratories, water laboratories that will be able to monitor, map the water resources, and provide this data to policymakers to manage better, uh, for example, agriculture program. Um, yeah, uh, we, <laughs> we all heard about uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, big data, uh, etc. So we cannot talk about science without talking about artificial intelligence, without talking about big data. At the agency, uh, we have almost 20 databases where this is wealth, where we can do some modeling and we can provide some, uh, some uh, information to the member states. So we are, uh, next week, we are having a big meeting uh, at, uh, at the IAEA where we looking at how uh, 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 AI for good, uh, how artificial intelligence, we can use it to really harness the technology, but uh, to provide support on all those topics that I have mentioned to you. And of course, uh, uh, to harness uh, digital, uh, artificial intelligence and digital in general, we cannot work in silos. We need, we need mathematicians, we need phys 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 physic uh, specialists, we need uh, uh, medical doctors to work together to be able to find the solution to the problem at hand, 
to the agriculture, etc. So this is also a new era where we really, uh, as scientists, we need to go and knock at the, the door, uh, next door, to say, hey, what, what are you working, what are you doing, and to see how you can help me and how I can help you with the work uh, I'm doing. And again, here, as organization, we cannot work alone. We don't have the unique, the, the, the silver bullet uh, solution, and that's why we need to uh, work with other organizations. I've mentioned to you that here is, uh, uh, we're signing with uh, uh, France uh, uh, Prezod uh, initiative that uh, also prepare for um, a, a pandemic uh, preparedness and we are working together with FAO, with WHO, etc. So we need to complementarities with academia, with industry, with the, um, also uh, international organizations. Um, uh, I mentioned that uh, science cannot be uh, just in our corner, our lab working in science. We need to spread the word and go out and talk about the work we do. Um, when I go out, it happened to me that I was uh, talking to a colleague from UN organizations, just going to see well, how we can collaborate. Uh, and, and, and when I told her I'm coming from IEA and we use nuclear uh, nuclear technology, she said, I don't want to talk to you at all because I have nothing to do with nuclear. So it just already when we, when we, we, hear, we hear the word nuclear, um, uh, people, they, they, they run away. And this is where we need to really talk about bring the youth, uh, bring the, 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 what, the, to understand, understanding, open mind, open to science, and, and because this is the future. We, not only nuclear technology, but science in, the, in general. So science and diplomacy, it's a, an area that we need also to develop further. And this is what we are trying to work on also at the IEA. I think I'm almost there. Thank you very much. And I hope I did not uh, make you uh, sleep after lunch. <laughs> uh, so thank you and I'll be open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mukta. I might leave you with that, and I'll... Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. I'm curious uh, as to, it looks like you have a lot of really fascinating initiatives going on. I'm wondering how we can best get involved and contribute to some of the work that I is working on. Thank you. Um, you can reach out to us, uh, as I have said, like for example, on Zodiac, we have a website on uh, for the cancer initiative. Also, we have a website that, that it, it's there and we welcome anyone who wants to come uh, uh, on board and contribute either through, um, as to spread the word. Uh, we need young uh, women and young men to really be with us and wherever they go, they can, they can talk about the work we do. So you can reach out to us. I can give you my business card. Here is Nora. I can also give you hers, but also reach out to, um, what is Cancer for All? The hashtag Cancer for All? Cancer Care for All. Okay. Cancer, so uh, we have, uh, you, 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 if you go to the IA website, you will find some information, but it's feel free to reach out to me and I can give you more information. Thank you, but thank you for your interest. I think we have a question here, right? Thanks so much. And um, I completely agree with the previous question, which is the breadth of what you support is really impressive. But that brings us with it, its own challenge, which is how do you set priorities for a very busy agency with limited resources, so many problems to tackle, do you set them by region? How do you how do you decide, for example, for the Asia Pacific, where the agency will focus its um, energies and efforts for the next twelve months, or whatever yeah. that period might be? Okay, very good question. We have a, <clears throat> a procedures um, on research. Um, we said the we said the, the 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 topic of research. This is agency technical, our technical stuff. They said the topic of research based on the global issues like climate change, we look at what, what can nuclear technology can do. Once we, we call on a couple of um, experts, they, they put the concept together and we call for proposal for, from institutions. So they come, any country can, can participate. You go to on our, way, on our website, you will see the call for proposal for research. This is building research capacity in countries. That's one part. 
Once the research is set and we have proof of concept, then we transfer to the member states. How? Member states, they will come to us. Um, let's say um, uh, Nepal will come and say, well, it's not nuclear uh, uh, power uh, country, but they will say, I want support on water and health and agriculture maybe. So, that's, so we have a document called Country Program Framework where countries set these priorities. And, and then we work with the country, so we transfer the technology, we say, okay, which institution you want us to work with, you will name our counterpart, and we start training and building this capability. That's one side. Now on this big, big um, initiative that I have mentioned, like Zodiac or Rays of Hope, um, we call countries that they want to come and participate with us. Uh, so they will send us a formal letter, say, okay, I want to be part of Nutec Plastic. I want to be part of Zodiac. But then here, um, we look again at the country, and if they develop it like Australia, Australia will be partner in this initiative. Australia will accompany us to give services to Southeast Asia, to small island states, etc. So this is how we, 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 we collaborate. Now, um, on how to choose, how we choose those topics, is again, globally, cancer is a big issue. And we have the mandates of radiation medicine. Zoonotic disease is still a big issue. Each one who can do whatever they can, they can contribute and is not enough. Food, sa food security, food safety, etc. So this is how we operate. We choose global uh, priorities. There is one other. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, my name is Akil Akbar. I was a researcher, now gone to the dark side of commercialization. What I'm interested in is um, how the IAEA partners with companies to be able to get impact, particularly we're considering the Sharonkov um, detector from CSIRO. Mm -hmm. Is it a similar sort of thing, and how do we actually then get impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also very good question, thank you. You know, we are demand driven for member, member states. We have 170 member states, so we, we serve them because they pay us. This is where our money comes from. Now, the politics of the, at the IA, we are now opening to the private sector. For example, on Rays of Hope, we are partnering with, with the big producer of linear accelerators to be able to provide training, capacity building, and also um, see, uh, give us good price for the market. So that's one way. Another way is, for example, we are working with companies, fertilizers companies, where they said, we want to use, we want to see how our product is used on the ground by plants so that we are also, uh, we want to contribute to the, to the global uh, efforts on climate change. So we do research to, to also advise how much fertilizer would be needed in plants. So this is one way. Other, other, other um, companies, we also, that they need specific products that to test it in multi-center study. So if they can contribute funding and it's beneficial to all our member states, we will partner with them to do that study. So it depends on the case, but now we are more open to work with private sector. This question here. Thank you. Thank you for your most uh, stimulating talk. Could you comment on your agency's attu attitude to uh, modular nuclear reactors? To? Modular nuclear reactors. Yeah. You mean the, the new era, like the, the small, medium, so small modular reactors, the SMRs? You know, it's uh, <laughs> an area where there is a lot of talk now, and the IA is, uh, is, up, is front line to make sure that the, commun that the information given to the member states is accurate. So we are developing now a report on the studies being done in many countries to make sure that the information given to the member states is accurate. We are also working on regulatory aspects. And we have several meetings on regulatory, how 
what would be the, the what do regulate what would be the regulator regulator's role also on legal aspects so it's all work in, pro, in in progress but this is something that we are in front line looking at uh, how this will evolve thank you thanks very much ah oh, steve Um, you commented several times during your presentation on the stigma that's attached to the word nuclear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something that we're very much used to uh, in this country as well. Um, and, you know, the way to approach that is to construct a narrative around the peaceful uses of, of nuclear technology, of course. Mm -hmm. But could you comment on the particular strategies that you have at the IAEA to hopefully overcome some of this stigma? Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing in different, in different lines. Having these big initiatives going out like this, the water initiative, the, the, the uh, Rays of Hope initiative is really bringing, we are not talking to only research institution, but we are going to the top level to really sensitize the policy makers, finance minister, health minister, to tell them where we are here and we can help you. So help me to help you. This is what DG always says. So we're, I think uh, if you look at countries that they are embarking on nuclear power, the first thing they start with is nuclear institution on peaceful use first. So, so that they can bring the community around to say, hey, we are here to serve you. So not starting with the nuclear power or nuclear energy, but starting with water, agriculture. That's one way. But at the end of the day, we are talking about atoms and how to harness the atoms for, 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 for peaceful use. And this is everywhere. You can't do science without harnessing the atoms. And I think we need to bring this down to the atom level, to atom saves lives. And this is what we do. We are having a ministerial conference next year. We are bringing ministers of health, minister of agriculture from all over the world uh, to really talk about what has been achieved, impact, success stories, that's important. Uh, cost effectiveness, how much you would invest in conventional methods and in nuclear methods and how much time you would gain, how much money. That's, that's language that I think everyone can understand. Thank you, Steve. And I'll, I'll let that be the last question because I, I'm sure a few of us are happy to come and join us for more afternoon tea, but I'd like to thank Dr. Mokhtar today for your inspiring talk and for all the wonderful questions. Um, please join to me with me. Thanks. <laughs>